did it yell at you? Did it did it say that you're recording? No, nothing. All right. Um, so, uh, welcome, Gage. We are off and running. We're going to run through our last eight review problems, and then we will uh, take any questions that we've got. So, reminder: final exam is open now. Uh, there are 50 multiple choice questions closing tomorrow, Thursday, and then there's a Friday section uh, that's open during seventh period. Uh, and then for our fall folks, it's open until the end of the day on Friday. For our spring folks, we'll be completing it during class. All right, so let's take a look at another rolling cylinder problem. To refresh your memory, last time we had a similar problem with a cylind uh, rolling cylinder rolling up. Let's see what we got now. So problem 43, a solid cylinder rolls without slipping up a ramp. While rolling up the ramp, in what direction is the net force on the cylinder? So we got net force and the net torque about its center of mass. Okay, so it's rolling up the cylinder or up the, the ramp. Take 60 seconds, think it through. Which way is the net force? Which way? is the net torque. All right, which of these feels most accessible, force or torque? Force. Force, that one seems super obvious to me. Which direction is the net force? Up the hill. Okay, it's not super obvious to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> the motion is up the hill. What's causing a force on something on a hill? Gravity. Gravity. Which direction is gravity pushing it? Down. Down the hill. Okay. Um, I would argue that the net force is down the hill. Is there an argument for up the hill? It is moving up the hill for sure, but I think it's slowing down. And since it's slowing down, the acceleration is down the hill. Um, a reduction in velocity would be a, a negative acceleration or acceleration down the hill. So I think the net force is down the hill. It's also due to gravity. Gravity pushes it down the hill. Um, okay, how about net torque about the center of mass? So for net torque, we have to think similarly. Is it speeding up in its rotation or slowing down in its rotation? It is slowing down in its rotation. That's correct, Mia. Um, so we know that as it goes up the hill, it's going to slow down in its rotation. So is, it net, is, it, is its net torque going to be in the same direction that it's rolling or in the opposite direction? Opposite. Opposite direction. Great. So I know that it's rolling with my red arrow, right? Because if something rolls, I assume it's going head over heels that away. Uh, so, but then the torque would be going the opposite direction. It's slowing down. So that would be that way. Um, and that way is, I can never remember which direction a clock goes. Is that way counterclockwise? Is my blue arrow counterclockwise? OK. My blue arrow is counterclockwise there. Um, another way that you could think about this one is that the uh, the, the cylinder is rolling in the red direction this away. Since it's rolling in the red direction, the thing opposing it is the force of friction, and the force of friction acts opposite to motion. So the force of friction, sorry, I'll do it this way, um, would be that way, up the hill. Um, and then if I push up the hill, that pushes me counterclockwise. Okay, so that's what's causing the torque to be backwards that the only force acting on it is the force of friction and the force of gravity. Um, 
but the force of friction is causing the turning, so that causes the counterclockwise rotation. So that leaves me with B. Questions? All right, let's move on to 44. On a frictionless surface, a puck slides towards and elastically bounces off of a rod, which is fixed to a frictionless pivot. Above is a top view. Which of the following are conserved in the puck rod system during this collision? Okay, so since this is a top view and I'm on a surface, I can pretty much ignore gravity, um, right? Nothing's hold, the weight of the rod isn't holding itself down or anything because this is an eagle eye view from the top. Um, which of the following are conserved in the puck rod system during this collision? We've got energy, translational momentum, angular momentum about the pivot. Let's think through which of those would be conserved. All right, so let's go one by one and figure out if we can determine which is or is not being conserved. Um, so let's, sorry, I apologize. I have a mockingbird um, that makes car alarm noises. There it is. Uh-oh, did I freeze? No, you're blinking. I'm still there, good. Um, so what do we think? Is energy going to be conserved in this case? You're nodding. That is correct. How do you know energy is conserved? Um, is it just because energy is conserved in an isolated system? Good. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, right? Conservation of energy says that energy overall, total energy, should be conserved. Um, now, we could also say it is a frictionless surface, so thermal energy shouldn't be an issue. Um, and I know that mechanical energy should be conserved, right? I'm not losing any to thermal. Um, and then it also, even if it was kinetic energy, um, it is elastic and kinetic energy is conserved in elastic collisions. So I could actually put a bunch of words before the word energy here and it would still be correct. I could say kinetic energy is conserved because it's an elastic collision and that is still a valid statement. Okay, how about translational momentum? Translational would be in a straight line. Is that going to be conserved? Um, no, because it goes the other way. It bounces off elastically. Great. And is this rod able to move translationally to, to account for that? It is not. It's fixed in place by that pivot point, right? That pivot point is not allowing it to move side to side. Um, and so its translational momentum can't be conserved because the rod can't move. Um, I know that the, the ball is going to bounce back, but the rod's not able to move in the other direction in order to account for that. So translational is a no. Um, and then that actually answers the question for you. So just by process of elimination, I don't actually have to figure out whether angular momentum is conserved uh, because there's no option for one only. Um, but is angular momentum conserved? It is. Yes, by process of elimination. We know it must be because the only remaining option is one and three. That one. Once we've eliminated two, we know that three has to be valid. Um, can somebody explain to me why angular momentum is in fact conserved uh, around the pivot is in fact conserved? Thank you. 
Well, if it's frictionless and we know that it has to pivot, then depending on the mass of the pivot, it's going to go slower or faster, but it's still going to pivot to some extent. Cool. We could also say there is no overall external torque about the pivot in the puck rod system. So, um, you know, we have maintained the same items, the puck and the rod. Uh, and so the overall external torque of the rod will be balanced by the torque of the puck and those should balance out to zero. So no torque means no overall shift in momentum. All right, lovely. Let's shift to 45. Zoom in on that for you. Two equal mass cylinders with strings wrapped around them are released from rest from the same height above the ground so they rotate without slipping. The cylinder on the left is solid while the cylinder on the right is hollow. So this one is solid. This one is hollow. Uh, which cylinder hits the ground first and which cylinder's string has a greater tension? And the mass is the same. Okay. So just first piece, uh, cylinders that roll off of ropes. Is there a more colloquial phrasing for that item or toy? You might call it a yo-yo. It's not technically a yo-yo. It's not around the pin in the middle, but it's effectively a yo-yo. All right. So think through this one for 60 seconds. All right, this is a good tricky one. So let's start with hitting the ground first. Which one do you think will hit the ground first and why? The solid one. Great, why do you think the solid one will hit the ground first? Because the hollow one should be, um, what is it, the, most, the moment of inertia? Good. Should be the limiting factor there since all the mass is on the outside. So the solid one should be able to unwind faster and therefore hit the ground first. Good. It's easier to get the solid one moving, right? It's easier to make the solid one spin. Um, and so the solid one should spin faster, quicker. It should accelerate at a greater rate, um, which means the solid cylinder hits the ground first. Um, I agree with that because the solid cylinder has a lower moment of inertia i. Um, you could also think of this like the string is like our ramp where we roll different circular objects down a ramp and the solid ones got to the end first. Solid things get down uh, faster uh, when they're going down a hill. And the, the string is like a unraveling hill. Okay, what about greater tension in the string? This one for me is a little bit trickier, but what is tension? It's a type of? Force. It is a force. Okay, so let's think about the forces on these objects. So the tension would be the force along the string or the force going up. What force is pulling it down? Gravity. gravity. Good. So I have gravity going down. I have tension going up. Um, since it's accelerating downwards, I know that gravity is a little bit larger 
right? It's winning by a little bit. Um, and gravity, since they have the same mass, has to be equal for both of them, right? So my force of gravity has to be equal in each case. But I also know that one of them gets there first. So the solid one got there first. That means it has to have a greater net force going downwards, so it has greater overall acceleration, right? It has to have a larger F net. This one is going to have a smaller F net. And what does that mean about the force of tension on the solid one? I think it means that the force of tension has to be less. So since I know that the solid one got there first, the solid one uh, then had the greater acceleration. So the solid one has a greater net force. And since gravity is equal, the tension force on the solid has to be less. So the tension force that's greater has to be the hollow one, leaving us with part B. Everybody OK on this? I probably could have exaggerated the sizes of some of these arrows, showing that red is clearly equal to red on that one. And I'll use green, little tiny f sub t versus much larger f sub t there. Equal. Good. All right. Another spinner. Problem 46. A cylinder spinning counterclockwise is dropped onto a different cylinder spinning clockwise, both viewed from the top, both as viewed from the top. Oh, OK, the spinning is viewed from the top. The image is from the side, but the spinning is viewed from the top, all right? About a vertical axis. The two cylinders stick together and both spin counterclockwise. Which of the following can be concluded for certain from this observation? So one is a cylinder spinning counterclockwise. So this one is counterclockwise. This one is clockwise. And then after they stick together, uh, I have cylinder, cylinder, not necessarily drawn to scale. And overall, they are stuck together and they are spinning counterclockwise. Okay. So trying to figure out which one is absolutely certain from this observation. Take 60 seconds, see if you can figure it out. All right, what do you think? Anybody feeling bold? B. Uh, was that a B or a D? B as in bold. OK, B as in bold. <laughs> Excellent language. All right, so let's walk through it. Um, so A would be the drop cylinder has a greater mass. That could account for it. If the drop cylinder had a bigger mass, that could work. Um, but it doesn't have to, right? It could also be where the mass is, um, is located, right? My cylinder could have more mass on the outside 
and that could give it a greater rotational inertia. Or it could be spinning faster. So greater mass could do it, but I also have some situations in which greater mass overall wouldn't do it, right? If I had one of them with a way bigger rotational inertia by putting more mass on the outside, or I had one of them going way, way faster, that could also account for it. So I'd say A doesn't necessarily have to be true. The drop cylinder has a greater rotational inertia about the center vertical axis. So that's taken out one of my factors, right, where the mass is located. Um, but I could actually have a greater rotational inertia in what I'm going to call the losing disk, the one that gets pushed the opposite direction, um, if the first one was going crazy fast. So if this one was going like a thousand rotations per minute, and this one was going 10 RPMs, well, that's a uh, hundred times more. So that means I could have less rotational inertia and still it would rotate in the direction of the faster one, right? Because really what I'm looking at here is a conservation of momentum. I have IW before, so I1W1 plus I2W2 has to equal the total I12 W12 because they stick together. Right? My rotational momentum has to match. Um, so I would argue B, I can also eliminate by increasing my rotational inertia. The drop, or sorry, by rota in, uh, rotational speed. The drop cylinder has a greater angular momentum about the center vertical axis before the collision. Okay, so now. I'm talking about this one is going to be one, this one is going to be two. If one has a greater angular momentum, that part, then it would cause it to end up spinning in the counterclockwise direction. So I'm feeling pretty good about C. And then the last one is D, the drop cylinder has a greater rotational kinetic energy. So rotational kinetic energy would be one half I funny looking W squared. Well, because they stick together, it's an inelastic collision. So rotational kinetic energy does not necessarily have to be conserved or kinetic energy generally does not necessarily have to be conserved. Um, so I don't think that the kinetic energy makes much of a difference. Um, and that funny looking W is carrying too much value in this one. So I would go with C. That would be my thought process on that. All right. Down to our last four. Problem 47, a toy consisting of two identical spheres attached by a light rope is thrown upwards with a clockwise rotation about its center of mass. As it moves upward, the string stretches out. Ooh, which of the following describes what happens to the angular momentum and the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass of the two sphere system? Okay. So let's talk through this one piece by piece. Since the string has stretched out, what do we know has changed? These are spinning, right? The diameter has changed. The diameter has changed, good. And because the diameter or the radius has changed, which value in terms of momentum, energy, rotation has changed? The moment of inertia. The moment of inertia. Good. So I know that I has increased, right? My moment of inertia, because I've put more mass further from the center, um, I have increased my moment of inertia. Okay. Now, I know, well, let's see. I guess I, I don't know, but I do know. What do I know about angular momentum? If I throw something up and then it slightly stretches, well, what do I know about momentum generally? It's conserved. It's always conserved, right? Have I received, have I gotten any additional force or torque or anything on this? rotating toy. Nope. 
other than the balls moving further apart from each other, there's no force there. So I think the angular momentum has to stay constant. Um, also, in terms of bad test writing, there are two options for stays constant, but only one option for increase or decrease. So maybe it stays constant. Um, so stays constant seems to make sense. Momentum is always conserved. Now for rotational kinetic energy, since I increased and I know that I, funny looking W, had to stay constant, as I increases, funny looking W has to decrease by the same amount, right? Or proportionally. Since rotational kinetic energy is one half, funny looking I, W squared, as I increases, but W decreased by the same amount, which factor matters more? The moment of inertia or the rotational inertia in uh, rotational kinetic energy? Which factor should I pay more attention to? The I or the funny looking W? Um, angular velocity. Angular velocity, funny looking W. Why should I pay more attention to that one? Because it is squared. Because it is squared. That is correct. So since this one decreases, I believe the rotational kinetic energy should also decrease because I'm squaring my decrease. So I think that leaves me with A. There you go. Next one, 48. A pendulum bob attached to a light string is held horizontally and released from position at position one and swings down through position two. What is the magnitude and direction of the bob's acceleration at position two? So it starts at one, swings through two, magnitude and acceleration. Or sorry, magnitude and direction of the acceleration. So just as a um, conceptual understanding piece, which project would this correlate to? The funnest tree swing. It's sitting on a swing, right? You're, you're on a funnest tree swing. The bob in this case, the circ, the dot is a person. So which way do you feel pushed? When you're at the bottom of the swing, which way do you feel like you're being pushed? Down? I guess you do feel like your body is pushing hard against the bottom of the swing. Um, although I am feeling pushed up towards the center of the circle because the seat is pushing on me upwards. I'm going to go ahead and say that that was a bad question for me. I'll try that one again. Um, The acceleration would have to be up because it's no longer moving down. Correct. It is changing directions. That's right. Acceleration is, in fact, up because that's the direction it's going to start going. All right, it's going to start moving towards the center of the circle.
So if the acceleration has to be up, would it have to be D? Because you would have to go against like the gravita gravitational acceleration. You're right. Let's see if we can solve it out. Okay. So does anybody have a anybody have a, an attack point on this one? A way of conceptualizing this. All right, so let's think about the acceleration. Um, the acceleration as an object moves around a circle, right, uh, is going to be centripetal, right? We know that right here, I have centripetal acceleration going that way. Uh, and I know that centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. Now, that leaves me with this V issue, right? But I also know that I have a, a downwards force, which would be like acceleration due to gravity or G. Um, now that leaves me with this velocity issue. So how would I find the velocity of the object at point two? It's going from a certain height, right? Um, and I think I can call the height, the length r, r, if I say this is the radius of the circle. Um, my general order of operations is I'm always going to see if I can attack it from a conservation of energy. Does the ball have a conservation of energy from one type to another type? Why does the ball go from point one to point two? It switches from gravitational potential to kinetic. Good. So I'm going to go from gravitational at point one to kinetic at point two. Um, gravitational at point one, it is up a height of r, right, one radius or one length of string. Um, so that would be the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity times change of y, which in this case is r, goes to the kinetic energy, which is going to be 1 half mv squared. v would be my total velocity at the bottom. Mass will cancel on both sides. Multiply both sides by 2, 2 those cancel. And then I need to take a square root and a square root. So I'm left with v equals square root of 2gr as my velocity. Now I plug that in over here. Acceleration equals square root of 2gr squared, so that'll take care of that part, over r. The r cancels with the r, leaving me with an acceleration of 2g. I also know that it's going to be up because it goes towards the center of the circle. Anybody want to make an argument? So I'm, this part I'm certain about, right? Direction of the acceleration at point two should be up. The one part that I'm not certain about is when I'm down here at point two, do I still have a force of gravity going down on that ball? I know that I have a force of a centripetal force, a sub c, that goes up, 
And I now know that that force, or sorry, that acceleration is 2g. However, I could also see that we have an acceleration going down of g. And I think there could be some validity of saying, well, shouldn't we have a net force or a net acceleration going up of just g, 2g minus g? Now, these questions were written by another uh, teacher, and they have their key as d, saying 2g should be the correct answer. Um, so up and 2g. But I could see an argument for going to that one based off of subtracting out the g. Can anybody tell me why my thought process might be wrong? Okay, this is one where I am genuinely uncertain. Um, it has a key listed at D, and that would ignore that would involve ignoring that uh, force down on the bob. Um, but I also think that there is a force of gravity pushing down there, so uncertain. Questions? No, Mr. Williams, you just made things more confusing. Good, wonderful, apologies. Next question, 49. All right, a planet orbits a star in a circular orbit. Which of the following best explains why the kinetic energy of the planet is constant? All right, what do we think? Let's go through one by one. Uh, answer A, the net force on the planet is zero. Is there a force on the planet if it's going around a star? There is, what do we call that force? Gravity, good. So there is a force, the net force is not zero. That one doesn't work for me um, because we do have a force of gravity. Um, there is only one force on the planet. Uh, that's valid. There is only a force of gravity, right? F sub G that way. Uh, but does that influence the kinetic energy? I'm not totally sure. I'm gonna say that's like a maybe it's an accurate statement, but I'm not sure if it explains the kinetic energy. The net force on the planet is always parallel to its direction of motion. The force is towards the star. The direction of motion is uh, tangential, so they are not parallel, I would argue. That one is out for me. The net force on the planet is always perpendicular to its direction of motion. That does appear true. That does look like a 90 degree angle. Now, does the perpendicular nature of that one force cause its kinetic energy not to change? Effectively, the answer here is yes. Um, an object in motion is gonna stay in motion. Kinetic energy is gonna be 1 half mv squared. If, I, if my force, is perpendicular to my velocity, then I'm not actually impacting that velocity. The tangential velocity remains constant the entire time. So that is a valid D. The tangential velocity should remain constant because there is no 
uh, force in that direction, right? There's no vertical component of the force. All the components of the force are just sideways. All right, very last one. Hooray! A block with mass M is compressed against a spring, a distance delta X on a frictionless table. So it's compressed, change of X. Released, separates from the spring, and lands a horizontal distance D away from the table with a kinetic energy K. So it's going to go here, boom, and it has a kinetic energy K at the end. If the block is replaced with a block of greater mass and the experiment is repeated, what will happen to the horizontal distance traveled and the kinetic energy just before landing? Ooh, all right. So let's start with horizontal distance traveled. So this one's going to have to be an energy conservation, I believe, because I have a spring here. And so the block starts with spring potential energy. So spring potential energy is going to give, actually, here, do you guys want to, let's go ahead and do it. See if you can solve it out. All right, so let's start with the horizontal distance in the air. In order to figure out the horizontal distance in the air, which factor do we have to pay attention to? What controls how far somebody, uh, what, what controls this horizontal distance D? The horizontal velocity. Good, I have to pay attention to that velocity in the horizontal direction. Right? or V sub X, I guess I could call it. Um, I'm using H for horizontal or V sub X would be fine too. Um, so I need to pay attention to that horizontal velocity. In terms of energy, I'm just paying attention to that, that leaving velocity. So which energies am I gonna pay attention to here? What am I gonna start with at the very beginning? I'm gonna start with some spring potential energy then as I leave, I'm paying attention to the velocity, so it should be kinetic energy. So 
the spring potential energy is going to be one half kx squared to the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared. Now, in my new experiment, I have a greater mass, but that's the only thing that I've changed. So does my initial spring potential energy change? It does not. I have the same spring potential energy. Um, since my mass has increased, my velocity will have to decrease in that kinetic energy piece in the middle. Um, that then means that I have less of a horizontal velocity, so I will travel less of a far distance d. So I should see less than d as my new distance traveled. OK. Now, the new kinetic energy just before landing. Now I've got to include a new type of energy. So I start with a set amount of spring potential energy, but now I'm going to include the Earth in my system um, because I'm also going to fall off a table horizontally. So I'm going to start with spring potential energy plus gravitational potential energy. I realize my S's and my G's look very similar to each other. Let's really make that an S. Um, then at the end, I go to kinetic plus gravitational. And then finally, at the end end, I go just kinetic. So the gravitational has gone away. Now, in this case, the spring potential energy here transferred to kinetic energy here. Um, that kinetic energy was all included there. Um, and that's constant, right? That spring potential energy was all transferred to kinetic energy because the gravitational and the gravitational don't impact things. Then as it fell, I have u sub g, this remaining u sub g here, that gets transferred to additional kinetic energy there. So that's going to be, uh, nope, m g change of y transferring to mv squared. If I increased my mass here, uh, what would happen to that overall gravitational potential energy that I'm transferring to kinetic energy? It would have to increase. Greater mass means I have greater gravitational potential energy that is transferring to kinetic energy. Um, and so I have overall a greater kinetic energy when I hit the bottom. So I should see greater than k, leaving me with answer d. Anybody have a different way of solving that one? I believe that you could also solve by trying to do a full kinematic uh, shift, right? And saying, OK, I've got my gravitational plus my uh, kinetic here. I could try to solve for that velocity, assume it's going you know, one third as, as great, uh, and then figure out that additional gravitational piece. You basically set some numbers to it. Um, run it through using some kinematic equations and figure out the total mass and velocity hitting the ground for that final kinetic piece. But I don't think we need to. OK, so that is question 50. Um, questions on that? Great. Remember, when in doubt, start with conservation of energy, then momentum, then forces. Um, in that case, we've got some additional time. What other questions do you have from previous practice tests 
or from anything else that you would like to go over. I have a question about how the final works. Yes. Logistically. Yes. Could I exit out of it and then finish, like start it today and then finish part one tomorrow? Yes. Okay. So the timer doesn't keep going when you close it. The timer does keep going, but it allows you to finish even after the timer has expired. The timer is not, the timer is not, so here's, here's the difference between our final exam and the AP exam. On our final exam, the timer is more advisory. It tells you, oh. it tells you when your 90 minutes have expired, but it can keep going indefinitely. And it'll just tell me, hey, they took a thousand minutes to complete this one. Um, and then I'll be like, hmm, that sounds like they went to bed and then finished it later. And I would say that is OK for our purposes. On the AP exam, the timer is a hard stop. Yeah, I understand the AP okay. exam. I was just right. asking about the final. Got it. Yep. Just want to make sure that, like, I mean, ideally, I'm trying to help us uh, learn how to get used to timed questions, because that's one part that we really have not done, because we've been remote for a lot of the year. Um, the the questions had kind of an open-ended timing piece on it, but you can blow through the timer and it's still okay. I will not deduct any points if you don't hit your timer time. So if you'd like to do 25 today and then 25 next week, that's okay. Uh, let's see, question. The AP is next week. I'm confused if the final this week is necessary. Great. So for fall semester students, the final exam is optional and can only help your grade. Um, so basically, if you uh, ended up with a grade that was not the grade that you were hoping for, um, if you scored a three on the final exam, I would bump your uh, overall course grade up to a B minus. If you score a four on the final exam, I'll bump your overall course grade up to an A minus. That also goes for the AP exam. Um, and that's also true for spring semester students. Um, if you score better on the final exam, I will just give you that score as your final test grade. If you score worse on the final exam, I will not allow it to harm you. So it is a reasonably low stakes opportunity to show what you understand. Uh, same deal for the AP exam. If you take the AP exam and your results come back and you earned a four on the AP exam, but you previously had a B in the course, I'll bump it up to an A. It, basically, if you can demonstrate that you know how to do it, I will give you the credit for that work, including going back and filing grade change uh, request forms with the front office. For seniors, that probably doesn't mean that much to you, especially if you the AP exam, you've already graduated. I'm not sure if I can change a grade after you graduate, but for juniors, uh, it may make a difference. Other questions or pieces you'd like to go over? All righty. Um, in that case, I think you're going to do really well. I think that you're ready for it. Um, I think that you're going to do really strongly. Um, and I am really, really pleased with the progress that you've made. And I think uh, we are in position. You guys have taken so many practice questions. Uh, in part because every single unit test was all direct practice questions from the AP. Y'all are dialed up and ready to go. Um, the one piece is, you know, timing of those questions. And even as we've done the reviewing, I've gone real slow. Uh, and if you're taking the real AP, it also doesn't let you go back in questions. So you take the question, and then once you click to the next one, that one is gone. You can erase it from your memory and just keep working forwards. Um, on our final exam, you can move back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I think at this point, it's just a matter of getting those reps, doing the practicing, saying hello to my friendly mockingbird friend. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you got it. 